Chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for it, this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. And it may be well with thee that thou mayest live long on the earth. Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Slaves, I know the King James Version, and probably all of your Bibles says servants. Not an accurate translation. Slaves. Be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing services to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. You masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. Simple summary. The second half of the epistle, after Paul, as um, uh, Brother Brian rightly laid out for us this morning, following the pattern of Paul, he always tells us who God is and what God has done for us, spends the first half of the letter painting the picture of how awesome God is and, and how much we owe him. And then, you know, the pivot somewhere in the middle of the epistle usually and the word therefore, in light of how good God has been, here's what we ought to be doing. And, and he lays it all out, and so very practically, as, as practical as that, he's got something to say to everybody. Husbands, wives, children, fathers, slaves, masters. We all have a duty, right? We've all got a duty. We have an obligation, and he lays out that obligation. It's in light of um, all that God has done for us that we look at our duty, our obligation. Go, okay, this, is, this, is my, this is my thing, and I need to do this. Signing off the letter, he begins in the 10th verse to say, finally, <laughs> this is the summary of this letter. The end of this letter, preachers do it in you know, a, a live setting uh, to give you hope. You know, they'll go, and finally, in closing, it's the <laughs> thing that preachers are famous for, for bringing you back to consciousness, getting you, getting you excited. Oh, it's almost over. And finally, in my first closing, but Paul here, he, what he does is say, this is the end of the letter. This is the last thing I want to say to you, finally. Be strong in the Lord, my brother. Be strong, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, what I'm going to say to you may be somewhat repetitious if you've had to endure my preaching before. I'm going to say again, God made us male. He knew it. He had something in mind when he made us male. It was the, the, the gender distinctions are his doing. It is really sort of what creation, you, you, you read the account of creation and, and everything goes from one level of good to another level of even better. There's a progression to the whole creation account given to us in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. But it's all moving somewhere. And the ultimate act of creation is God creating man in his own image, in his own likeness. But he's not done. You can tell he's not done when he says it is not good. For everything that was done, it's called good. But it is not good that man should be alone. I'm, I'll make him a helper. Suitable for him. God said it is not good that man should be alone. I'll make him a helper. So that is God kind of cluing us into this is the high point of creation. This is what all of this creative action has been leading up to. And that is the creation of gender. Among humans created in the image of God. God takes the one man that has been created in his image, and he takes that man created in his image, puts him into a deep sleep. I point out often, I'll, I'll point it out again, what God did not do is worth noting. God said, I'll make him a helper. He did not repeat what he had done to make Adam. 
He formed Adam out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, man became a living soul. God did not repeat that to make woman. God did not form her of the dust of the ground and breathe into her nostrils the breath of life and she became a living soul. He didn't do that. What he did do is he put the man into a deep sleep and he took from him what he made into woman. And there is a mystical sense in which God actually took the, the likeness of God, the image of God, and divided that into two. So that for us, humanly speaking, we look to a mother and a father for things that actually come from God the Father. Our Father in heaven is actually best seen when a man and a woman come together in the holiness of marriage. And they complete each other. They make up for the lack that each other has. They are what each other has. Lacks. There's something about this wonderful thing when, when a child, and most of us did not have the benefit of this, but when a child can look at that relationship, can look at that union, can see two people that are actually functioning as one. You see two people that are actually complementing, actually completing one another. There are things that you can only know about the goodness of your Heavenly Father as you have seen it in the kindness, gentleness, of your mother. There are things that you can only know about God the Father as you have seen it in the courage and the strength, the clarity, the decisiveness of a father. In an ideal situation, it is in that thing, the family, this invention of God in marriage that God is actually seen. It is, it, there's a sense in which the, the very image of God is restored when two people who know the Lord, two people in whom the Spirit of God lives, come together as a man and wife, and they truly become one in a way that no two men can, in a way that no two women can. They become one in a way that everything else attempts to mock, everything else attempts to imitate. In that union, there is a sense in which the image of God is seen, best reflected. So I would maintain that the, the creation of gender, these distinctions between men and women, were really what all of creation was moving toward. Them. The scriptures. God made us to be men. And in making us men, I maintain, brothers, as I've said to you many times before, he made us for a war. And every one of us, as we were born, when we were little boys, we, we were born into a cosmic conflict between good and evil, a universe at war, and we knew it innately, and we wanted to affect it. We wanted to be in that fight, good versus evil. We dreamed about it. We dreamed of greatness in that great conflict. So I find myself coming to this section of this epistle. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Biblically speaking, something else I'll repeat to you right now, manhood is in fact associated with strength, strength of character, even, yes, even physical strength, that 40% of the average man's body is muscle tissue, whereas it's about 25% for the average woman. God made us to be the stronger. God made them to be the weaker. Weaker doesn't mean inferior, but weaker. 1 Peter chapter 3 just means more easily broken, delicate. And there's a, there's a beauty to that weakness. There's a beautiful sort of weakness, a delicateness that the scriptures reveal associated with womanhood that is not supposed to be a characteristic of a man. I was a boy once, just like you fellows were once boys. And we dreamed of being men. The question I would ask you at this moment, are you the man you dreamed that you would be? Are we? Are we, are we at least on our way? <laughs> there was a man that I looked to as I, as I thought about growing up. I want to be, want to be a man. I want to accomplish great things. I want, I want people to see me as, as great. I wanted to be respected. And I think... There's some of that that is the total expression of, of um, 
the very image of God in us. Oh yeah, the image of God is messed up by sin. And men will go way beyond just wanting to be respected to wanting to be worshipped. That's the reality. At the same time, there's something in every single one of us that makes us strive. There's something in the heart of my little boy, my, my now seven-year-old son, that every time he accomplishes anything on the wrestling mat, he looks to see, did I see it? The first person he wants to impress is me. I'm very grateful for that. What a privilege. Now, some of you guys don't know my story, but I didn't, I didn't grow up with a dad. I, I had a dad that left us when I was very young. There was uh, two um, teachers that played significant roles in my life. Two male teachers as a boy. One played the role of a messenger from Satan. Well, he was a homosexual, and he really did mess up my mind. He did, in fact, try to drag me into a relationship. All the time I thought he was just being like a dad. No idea I was being groomed for a romance. The repulsion that came over my soul at the realization of what this was really all about on a camping trip really almost completely derailed my life. Sent me down a path, a, a really messed up path, a path where I was just weirder and more violent and more bitter. Just wanted to, uh, my only ambition as a, as a boy after that season was just to get big enough and strong enough and nobody could ever mess with me. Nobody could mess with me, nobody could take advantage of me, and, and uh, ta I could take vengeance on the world. But there was another man that came, another teacher, a male teacher, and I didn't have a relationship with this guy. I just saw him in the classroom. I didn't go on camping trips with him because I'd kind of been burned, right? <laughs> I wasn't asked either, you know, I'm not. But this man, this man was a Christian. This man was a Christian. This man was sent by God. He taught me science in middle school. His job was to lay out the theory of evolution. I've often t testified about this man, Lawrence Easton. See, I, 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 my little son, Ben, bears the middle name Lawrence for that very reason, for the role that this man played. A role that was so very significant because it was more than just what he knew that he was passing on to me. It was who he was. It was the kind of man that he was, the way he lived. Mr. Easton, he was tall and strong. He was handsome. He had a beautiful wife. He had a really cool Magnum P.I. mustache. <laughs> and he knew things. He knew established scientific laws. He laid out for me all this, the laws of science that this is the 1970s, the laws of science that destroy the theory of evolution. He told me every reason why Darwin was wrong. And it was the very Bible that he owned, that he had on the corner of his desk, that he was not allowed to read to us. that I connected who he was and all that he knew with that book. It was the day that I asked the question, Mr. Easency, what, well, then what's the deal? Where did we come from then? My 13-year-old heart had to know, and I remember him turning to face the class and him saying, I've testified to this before to you, man. He turned and he took a deep breath and sighed, searching for the words. Shaking his head, he said, I, it's against the law for me to tell you what I know. <laughs> Which was the perfect answer to give to this rebel. <laughs> because once he said that, I went, oh, really? <laughs> oh, it's against the law, so they don't want me to know. <laughs> well, I've had enough of them already. <laughs> they don't want me to know. I must know. It's that book, isn't it? Said book. He said a lot by what he did not say. I aspired one day that I would be, he taught science and health. And I remember him just telling us in, in class. I remember one day he said, all right, listen, it was a health class. talking about muscle, growing muscle, muscle tissue. And he, he just mentioned, he wasn't boasting, he mentioned curls. And, I, you know, he's, he, he's, he's a National Guardsman, and he, you know, on, on the side of his teaching gig. And he's, he um, tries to stay healthy. And I remember him saying in the class, you know, I, I curl 100 pounds this many times. But if you curl it a whole lot more times, a lighter weight, it's a lot better. I remember that. I remember just being a 13-year-old going, you can curl 100 pounds. <laughs> Man. I remember the thought. I remember thinking, I want to be like you, Mr. Recency. I want to be like you. Lord used him in my life. 
his witness, who he was, and everything else. I started reading the Bible that year because of his uh, witness. Recent weeks, in fact, all winter long, my old friend, Lauren sees since he is in hospice care. He's dying now, and he's dying like a man. And, um, you know, I've always said I want a glorious death myself. Always I've said, you know what, I want a Muslim bullet right through my head. I want my head cut off. I want to be right mid-sentence. I don't want to, I want something, I, you know, I've always said, I want, you don't want to die from stupid. Now there's a high degree of prob probability on that, see. So I make it a matter of prayer. I don't want to die from stupid. I want to die for the cause. I want a worthy death. A death whereby you could glorify God. Well, I've always said that. I'll tell you, it all looks different after I've, I've watched my old teacher. You know, a man I once aspired to be like. I've seen him embrace the weakness of his uh, dying. I've watched him as he's changed, as his hair is gone, and his strength is gone. And, and, you know, every, I go down every Wednesday. I drive down, it's an hour and a half to where he lives on the coast. And every Wednesday is sort of a new landmark. And he goes, well, I can no longer climb the stairs, sleep in the bed with the wife of my youth. So down here now on the first floor, I got this hospital bed. Every week it's something. Last week, he's a man. And, but embracing it with such humility. Such humility with such a, a gratitude that I'm going to heaven. I, you know, just, I talk to him about heaven. I talk to him about what little our minds can grasp about where he's going. And about the prime. The prime that he's never known. The prime is ahead of him, not behind him. And talk to him about um, the, the glory that will be his. And, and um, the reward waiting. And we, we've had some great talks. In such humiliation. You know, a week ago he looked at me and said, I have a question, and uh, we talked a lot about his funeral. We planned that out. We've, we've overplanned his funeral, but he, um, he said, I have a question, and I understand if you say no, but uh, it's awkward. You know, he said, you, you think you're strong enough that you could uh, lift me up and put me on the commode? He's like, got this bedpan, it won't work. My legs won't work. I can't do it. I said, I know I'm strong enough. I've been, lifting my, I've been lifting weights my whole life, just for this moment, just for this honor right here. So I bear hug my old teacher, get it done, and ultimately he's got to endure the humiliation of his wife cleaning him up while I hold him. His face is, is buried here on my shoulder. He's weak, can't do anything. But he's apologizing. I said, do you understand the witness that you gave to me? You understand what you did, for how God used you in my life? This is the greatest honor I've ever known. And um, I read, honestly, I, I still welcome a Muslim bullet. But watching <laughs> the, the humility and the faith of a one strong man watching strength leave and embracing it has um, altered my whole perspective on that. You know, you, He's dying like a man. Most commendable. You remember what it was when we were little boys and we dreamed one day we're going to be big and strong and we're going to do things, right? Remember? Please consider now, oh, you grown up little boy, that this is that day that we dreamed about. Now's the, now's the day. For any real greatness that is ever going to come out of these lives of ours to the glory of God to manifest. Now's the time. Now's the time for us to put away all that boy stuff, childish things. Even if, even if we've carried those childish things all the way into this season we're in, it's time to put them away. Because the hour is late. We have been invited into a fight that we cannot possibly win on our own. We've been invited to do a fight. Is, is he says, you've got to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And he tells us in the next verse why. 
the subsequent verses here will point out to us. We've got to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Where verse 12 says, For we wrestle not against, princip- against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. <laughs> Brothers, we're, we're in a fight that, is, as I've said to you before, so outside of our weight class, it's outside of our life form class even. That we have been invited into a fight against higher forms of life. I will remind you once again that according to the 8th Psalm, God made men a little lower than the angels. He made men a little lower than the angels and then having made us a little lower than the angels has invited us into a fight with angels. (laughs) He made us a little lower than the angels and then calls us into a fight with beings that are higher forms of life. They've been around a long time. They've studied our kind. They see us. We can't see them. they got all kinds of advantages. We're absolutely, as he said, I send you out as sheep among wolves. Now, how do you like that? I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Wouldn't you love it if he would have said, I'm sending you out as wolf among sheep? But he didn't. We're not going out with our black leather jackets. We're going out with our little fuzzy sweaters on. (laughs) Sheep among wolves. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This is not a flesh and blood fight. It's against principalities and powers and rulers. Now, it's really kind of intimidating. If you really stop and grasp this, if you really stop for a minute and think about what we're against and what they would, if they had their way, what they would do with us, how this whole thing would end, wouldn't end with just a little public, you know, humiliating knockout. It would end with our souls in the hell. And everyone we love, likewise, in the abyss. I mean, think about all that is at stake. Think about this one reality that, and and maybe you can relate to this, better you who have done. (laughs) Any of you who have done any prison time, I'm sure in the room full of us sinners, some of us who have been incarcerated, yes, You've done the time there. You know what a punk is. A prison punk. That in our absolute sick society, which by the way, you guys know prison was never God's idea. God said beat them and get them back to work. The law was plain that crime ought to be dealt with quickly, swiftly, justly, evenly, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, though wrongly applied to personal offenses, was God's idea in the law with regard to crime and punishment. Simple. Restitution is God's idea. Think about public beating. I like the Proverbs. Proverbs 18 about the fool's mouth and bites a beating. His lips call for strokes. <laughs> St- strokes were once the way, right? It's, it's, it's such, it, oh, the, the genius of it. But instead, what we've done in our modern society in, in, in being humane We've done something so sick and cruel to human beings, we lock them up together with the worst of, you know, humanity. So they can do awful things to each other, and so in prison they, in fact, do. You know, it's crime school. People are are embittered. It's not the deterrent that anybody assumed it would be. Instead, you come out worse, right? Think of this little dude who used to come... Five foot seven guy, little white kid, always bouncing around his long hair. He wanted to be a drummer, rock and roll drummer, had dreams. He always had these drumsticks in his back pocket. He was hanging around me and the guys in my band and going, hey guys, you think, you know, you think I make, I, I can make it, you know, if, we, if, I, I, if I practice really hard. I remember this kid, he was like 17 years old. We always say, well, what do you mean, how do you define making it? You know, we try to talk to him about his life and about the Lord and he was just one of those kids, you know. They started doing burglaries. He did a big string of burglaries, and ultimately he got caught. In fact, he was committing these burglaries. My my little kid's sister, you know, she got juvenile time. He goes off to the 
the big house. You know, I saw him two years later when he got out. You, you've seen this. He, he looked like an old man. Poor little guy had been used, been used as an object of, you know, uh, he'd, he'd been a sex slave in prison. He, he'd been an, an object of, of men's abuse. Not an awful thing. And, I, and, and, you know, he didn't, the bounce was gone in his walk. He, um, you know, he snapped to this kid. His name was Dale. In fact, Dale's the father of my niece. He, he just snapped. One day he just snapped. And he's out prostituting himself after prison because he's completely destroyed. He, he sees he's nothing. He, he sees no value in his existence. And he's just down and, you know, homosexuals always got a place. They got a park, right, in the middle of Bangor, man. And he's down there just prostituting himself. And ultimately... One day he just told his brother, whoever picks me up today, I'm killing him. I'm going to kill him. And he did. He, he executed some, you know, middle-aged bank manager from the little Canadian border town. Came to our town for his perversion. And, you know, Dale executed him. He's gone away for life. That's what he's doing now. You've seen what happens to people in those places, what happens when someone becomes that kind of slave. Do you understand that what's at stake in the fight that we're in? Now, I want to paint a picture for you. I'd like you to feel something about this. In fact, I'd like you to get mad. Because there are devils that would like to punk you out. They would like very much to make you their slave. And they would get gratification from your sin. You thinking that you're doing your will. You thinking that you're doing your own will and that you're, you're, you're the man. And all the time you ain't nothing but their toy. Everything that they would do to you, they want to do to your children. They want to do that to your wife. They want to do that to everyone you love. They would have them all enslaved and drag them right down to the abuso. So there's a lot at stake in this thing. We've been invited into a fight which there is a lot at stake and we are absolutely incapable of winning this on our own. So the scriptures couldn't be any more emphatic with be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And put on all your armor. And, and get your weapon. Get it. Get your armor. Get your weapon. I'm not going to focus on the armor of God, the weaponry. Just that one thing, that we must be strong in the Lord. You've got to take up this one, this, this one weapon, the Word of God. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore. And in your loins good about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. What are we to do in this world? You get, we get suited up, as our brother Sandy called us to. You suit up. Get in your uniform. Get on your armor. Get your gear on. Get your rig on. And then take your weapon and then, and then do what? Well, you use it. You do what with it? Three things, primarily. Number one, you live it. Number one, you apply it. Number two, you preach it. You preach it. You speak the very word of God. Number three, you pray it. We're called to it right here. Do this. You suit up praying always with all prayer and supplications in the spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, Paul says, verse 19, pray for me, suit up, arm yourselves, and pray. Pray for me, he said. And he said, pray for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may o open my mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel. Some of the modern translations have him saying, pray for me, that I would speak boldly this gospel as I should. It's an intimidating thing to be standing against the entire world as he was. 
Do you realize that you now, as a Christian, like Paul, stand against the entire world? You guys all understand what's going on right now in your time, right? You understand that worldwide. Now I'm going to say something you can, you can take and weigh out. Worldwide, the American Christian or the professing American Christian has exercised profound influence and it has not been good in recent years. The apathy of the American Christian is responsible for the current leadership of this country coming to power. And that current leadership has changed America's role in the world. It is the very American Christian apathy that causes them to not engage, not take a stand, not think biblically, and not vote biblically, that is causing Christians in Nigeria to be slaughtered. 65 million, according to George Barna, 65 million identify themselves, self-identify themselves as, as evangelical Christians. That is to say that have had some kind of a life-changing experience with the gospel. They attend church at least once a week. They actually own and read a Bible. They give a portion of their income. And according to Barna, 65 million in this country. Now, you, think about this for a second. 52 million, only 52 million votes elects the entire federal government. Of all of what, 350 plus million people in this country, only 52 million votes actually elects that entire federal government. 52 million votes. Now there are 65 million who identify themselves as Christians, only half of which are even registered to vote, and of the half that are registered, only half actually go vote, and when they go vote, there's not any significant indication with exit polling that they vote like they know the Bible. And so we are where we are. Persecution for all of the brothers and sisters has erupted around the world on a level that at no time in human history has it been like it is right now. According to those guys with voices, uh, Voice of the Martyrs and other organizations, Amnesty International, other organizations that actually track these things, they have determined that there is more actual pers uh, persecution for Christians happening now than there has ever been in the entire 20th century since our Lord Jesus came. The church was born. And it was born under the Roman Empire, the tyranny of Rome. And you know of the six million or so Christians that were slaughtered those first three centuries. What's happening right now is eclipsing all of that worldwide. And the irony of it, that it is the American Christian who just doesn't care, he is comfortable, believes he's on his way to heaven, so let the world go to hell. Don't engage, don't vote, don't think biblically. Our pastors, generally speaking, are not teaching the Bible. You're blessed men. You've, you, you've been led by the Lord into good pastor. You have pastors, like your David Rosales, who will open up this book, and let the sermon pick him. He will open it up and take you from one end of this book all the way to the other end of this book. Model given to us by Pastor Chuck Smith, by J. Vernon McGee, by others who've come long before. But outside of our movement, guys, there's a, a horrible level of biblical illiteracy, ignorance. Ignorance that I thought I never would see in my lifetime. Barna, Barna Research, he polled, in fact, this is one of the most extensive polls that have been done in our lifetime. Very revealing poll that reveals exactly where Christians stand on the very fundamentals. And this is, this is Christians who were polled. They were asked these questions, just six basic. Do you believe in absolute truth? Do you believe the Bible is accurate? Three, do, is Satan a real being? Four, heaven cannot be earned. Is that correct? Five, Jesus lived a sinless life, right? Number six, God still rules in the world today. Nine percent. Nine percent of all the Christians polled by Barna agreed with those very fundamental truths. So we live in a time of great apostasy and great apathy 
The apathy is the real thing that, that I'm trying to do something about. I, I, I really do believe we can affect that. And I think we should. We must try. I believe in the words of John Quincy Adams, you know, um, duty is ours, results God's. Whether we actually turn anything around or not doesn't matter. The thing that does matter is that we stand. And that we take a stand and that we, we speak for God and we speak God's word. Um, Paul's request that we would suit up, that we would arm ourselves, and that we would then pray. That we would live it, that we would apply the word of God, that we would preach the word of God, and that we would pray the word of God. You take the sword of the Spirit and do it praying, praying always, with all kinds of prayers, praying in the Spirit. I would ask you to pray for me as you pray for your pastor. You guys are doing that, right? You know what? Let me ask you this question. If I told you, if, let me just ask you this. If I told you that your pastor is on a Muslim hit list, he spoke out enough against Islam, radical Islam. Ethnic Islam is, is dangerous in that it dopes men's souls into hell. But it's nonviolent. But, you know, true Islam, radical Islam, is a, is a horrible thing that must be spoken against. Your pastor's done that very boldly. And if I told you that he was on a list, on a hit list, would you engage in prayer on his behalf? Would you maybe even set up like a 24-hour prayer cover? You know, get a clock and just say, all right, everybody can, who, who can pray for 15 minutes? And just sign up on the clock and pray. And just intercede on behalf of your pastor. Wouldn't you do that? If I told you that, that was the case, I bet you would. Would you jump up and go, well, we're going to cover him in prayer. His life's in danger. But you understand, he's already been targeted by something worse than any Islamic uh, hitman. Those punks are nothing compared to what's after him. It's a scary thing. It's an intimidating thing. In fact, if your pastor, if any of us, Fail to look at the awesome strength and the awesome might of God. We can find ourselves quite overwhelmed. Because there is a lot at stake and there's also a lot against us. I, I boarded a plane about a year ago. Did a red eye from Ontario to Philadelphia. And I declare, brothers, a devil got on a plane with me. Whatever I just left, whatever meeting was, whatever the conference was that I preached at, it was fruitful. And initially I was excited. I was all fired up. Grateful, had that attitude that, you know, I'm just so glad that God could find something to do with me. That he, could, that he could ever do anything good, accomplish anything through this life is a miracle. It's a testimony to his grace. And I'm, all, I'm thinking these thoughts, but at some point or another, I declare some principality sat beside me in a plane and just started whispering in my ear, just leaning over, whispering in my ear, going, boy, what do you think you're doing? Who do you think you are? Don't you know that the greater the sphere of your influence, the greater the destruction is going to be when you go down? Because you're going down. You're going down. You can't live this. The level of moral purity required for this is beyond you. You can't do it. I'm telling you. I really started getting freaked out. Really did. Because you, I know me. You know you, I know me. The potential of stupidity, the potential of failure is enormous. And it freaks me out that God has trusted me with anything. And honestly, I find myself just getting so full of anxiety. I, I, I'm trying to initially, I'm trying to pray. I can't even pray out of it. It was so bad, honestly. I'm like, I'm, I'm not that, that fickle, gonna, you know, huh, huh, panic attack. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I think I'm like, I need a pill. Oh, I, I'm, not, I'm not, I try to act like a man all the time. <laughs> and I am freaked out like some little kid by the time I landed in Philadelphia at daylight. It was so bad. I was so overwhelmed with anxiety, so intimidated. Honestly, it was like I, I, um, it's like I tuned into Goliath and his trash talk. You know, get over here, boy. Get over here, boy. I'm going to pull you to, I'm going to feed you to the birds. Get over here. Am I a dog? that you've, you've insulted me as a giant with that stick. Get over here. And um, <laughs> like I've, I've, I've listened to it. Like I've just, oh, I've really provoked a giant with a stick. <laughs> what have I done? What am I doing out here? Really did. I had that awful feeling and I, it was so bad. 
I didn't know what else to do. I, I just had to call the brother. I mean, I called Joe Foch. I'm in Philadelphia, and I called Joe. Joe, Joe. I left him a voicemail. Call me. I said, need you to call me. Need you to talk to me. You know, Joe, God bless him, my brother. He called me. He listened for a minute. He goes, well, then, let me remind you of all that is for you. Let me remind you of who is with you, who is in you. <laughs> that, that conversation was stirring me, man. He just, he reignited a fire. And I find myself just glowing. Not, not that sort of, you know, carnal puffed up kind of, but just the, the reminder of God and his might, the power of his might, that he's made available to you and I, us little weaklings, us pitiful little humans, us sheep. He has empowered us. He's invited us to actually allow that power to flow through us. And he's given us this powerful weapon. It occurred to me. Why, why is this giant talking such trash? Oh, because he's scared. <laughs> he doesn't like the little human bugging him. <laughs> I got so fired up, brother. I got so stirred, so encouraged. I would have... If you would pray for your pastor, get your pastors on a regular, get, do, do it, guys. Get a clock, you know? Have somebody, just put a clock together. We, we do this thing at home called the prayer watch. Just asking everybody, can you, can you do 15 minutes? I'm not even going to say, can you not tarry one hour with me? Can you just do 15 minutes? Can you, can you not tarry one quarter of an hour with me? We just sign up. Maybe you got 15 minutes of drive time. You could commit to interceding at that time for your pastor, for your spiritual leaders. In fact, doing that at, at drive time <laughs> here might keep you from sin, you know? <laughs> commit, to, commit to some intercession. There's just some other time that you can set aside and you can look at that clock and you see vacancies, holes in the clock, and, and get to where you're like, there's enough of us. We can cover this, our pastor in, in, in prayer. It's like keeping a watch, man. You know, it's like being a sentry, a spiritual sentry. I mean, consider that, will you guys? Initiate it and, can, and just do it. I would ask if you would pray while you're praying. Pray, pray for me, like Paul said. Pray for me to have boldness. Pray for me that I would, have, I would speak the word of God boldly. God's opened a, a great door. I've got 16 states just over the next eight weeks. Every, from Alaska to Colorado. We have the privilege of going and, and speaking cross-denominationally to pastors and inviting them to do what we've been doing at Calvary for all these years. And let's get back to Bible exposition. More Bible. Your people are biblically illiterate. <laughs> now, now I'm listen, that's, um, that's not an easy thing to have somebody tell you when you've been preaching your heart out and preaching sermons for, you know, decades. And then some guy's going to stand up there with his white whiskers and go, all right, you need to change. You need to get the whole Bible to these people. You need to make systematic study of the Bible. You've got to get your people reading the Bible, the whole Bible. And you've got to get them to stand up and speak. We've got to stand up. The, the duty, the, oh, the, the, to whom much is given, much is expected. We, the heirs of the freedom that was bought and paid for by the lives of soldiers, the heirs of the freedom that God has provided us here are people to whom much has been given. I say that much is expected, much is required. We have the opportunity to influence the entire world from this land. And we've neglected it. The apathy of the Christian, abandoning the spiritual fights. And, and can I just say one more thing? Not even voting. If you're a Christian and you don't vote, you're in sin. It's like Peter denying the Lord. It's like Peter saying, I don't know him. You don't vote. You're like, it's like saying, no, I don't, I don't have a stand on moral issues. Yeah, I know million and a half babies per year being slaughtered and abortion, but, you know, can't do anything about it. If you don't vote, you're in sin. Your vote is not some, some little 
you know, right or privilege. It's a prophetic witness that you're bailing on when you don't do it. You know, vote with a Bible in one hand and a, and a, and a ballot in the other. And, and be bold. The fight that we're in, brothers, is way bigger than us. We've got to pray. We've got to plead with God. We can't just cop the attitude that so many evangelicals have sort of cop that, you know what, it's all going to go, it's all going to burn, it's all going to go to hell, it's all sort of, uh, fatalistically, they're like, you know what, one world government, antichrist, and one world money system, it's all moving in that direction, that's what it's supposed to do. You know what, there's a lot of mystery on this stuff, guys, but one thing I do know is that we have a duty, our duty does not change. We have a duty to stand against what is wrong and what is absolute tyranny, and tyranny is what we're seeing in our own day. The executive branch of our government has presumed rights that are not its own. Violations of our Constitution. You know why it's happening? Because we've all let it happen. Christians who vote or don't vote. The, 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 Russell Kirk, philosopher, he said politicians are just actors performing a uh, script that is written by the audience. Politicians are just actors performing a script that was written by the audience. People that are in power right now, you say, well, they, they don't represent me. No, they represent the people that voted for them. They, rep they represent the people that vote. So I, I, I want to encourage you, brothers, be in the spiritual fight. Don't be ignorant. Be in this fight. Pray, suit up. Pray the word of God, speak the word of God, live the word of God, but ultimately, duty is ours, results God's. Now, let me just ask you one question in closing. Is God dealing with your heart about your life? You're the kind of man that would come and be here all day long and listen to men speak the word of God to you. You have heard God's word be spoke. We ain't much. We, we stammer use our limited understanding and we use our limited use of language to try to convey something to you that would change your life, you know, forever. But it is up to you to receive and respond. I want to ask you before we leave today, are there men in this room that have yet to respond? That perhaps earlier today, invitations were given and you had a strong suspicion that you probably ought to do something, but you didn't because you're prideful. Don't be an idiot. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> brother, I, you, you've ignored kinder invitations today. <laughs> you, you said through kinder invitations, more gracious and more patient. Honestly, I'm just saying as your brother, if God is speaking to you, if God's talking to you about changes you need to make, some level of surrender that you need to actually do, well, then do it. Don't be an idiot. Don't rip yourself off. Don't let your pride cheat you out of the plan that God has for your life. 